patient love is what you will see Waiting to set you free say uh, yes, or at least a, a part of it says yes, yes, because we're beginning to see that your arms, the arm of Yahweh, is Yeshua, Jesus. And like Isaiah asks, is, like you say through Isaiah, is my arm shortened so that I cannot save? <laughs> the answer is no. For you even send your spirit into our heart. And it's your spirit in us that says, yes. So you beset us behind and before, and you bring us home. And so, Lord God, now in Jesus' name, through the power of your spirit, preach us home. Amen. Amen. I grew up knowing I was different, wrote Marianne Bird, and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate, and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others, a little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored, Mrs. Leonard, by name. She was short, round, and happy. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back, things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put into her mouth, those seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. <laughs> I read that to you and a little more last, last week at the end of the sermon. And then I said the word was in Mrs. Leonard. And then the word was in Marianne Bird. And now the word is in you. I'm talking about the word that creates and sustains all things. I'm talking about the word that hung on a tree in a garden. I'm talking about the word that came to Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets. I'm talking about the word that came to Mary and was born of Mary. Uh, the word we tried to kill that wouldn't stay dead. The word that's King of kings and Lord of lords who cuts the flesh from all men. From, from all men, and then brings all men together in one city, one temple, one bride, one body. I'm talking about the word that does everything. Does anything. People always want to know, okay, so um, what can I do? What do I have to do? What can I do? Well, apart from the word, you can do absolutely no thing. Nothing. But in the word, with the word, and by the word, you will do all things. Just words we say. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Just words. That's a rather modern notion. It's the idea that words don't matter, for they have no substance. Only matter matters. Since the enlightenment that I call the endarkenment that notion has been growing in our society, at least until about 1984, the year that I went to seminary and learned all about church growth. There have been times when the church was much more focused on the word, as if the word was all that mattered. And at those times, ironically, at those times it seemed as if the church mattered most or more than at other times. But by 1984, the church was focused on legislation and deeds, and the word was something that you used to grow your church. 
And so liberals did it in one way and conservatives kind of did it in another way. At the time, the moral majority was in full swing. Focus on the family, promise keepers were on the rise. 38 years later now, few would describe the church as moral or a majority or a picture of healthy families and certainly not a place where people keep their promises. Never before, or at least in my lifetime, have there been so many lies. Democrats say the Republicans are lying. Republicans are saying the Democrats are lying. And I think we're all saying, gosh, there sure seems to be an awful lot of lying. And what is a lie? Well, a lie is a word that is divorced from reality. It's how the evil one convinces us that nothing matters. In particular, the word. Modern science has taught us that words really don't matter. Only matter matters. And postmodern science, that is modern physics, is revealing that matter actually doesn't really matter. Only words. Because what is a word? Well, a word is information embedded in breath, which in biblical lingo, same word, is spirit. And you see, I think we often call that consciousness. No time to talk about all that now, but modern physics is revealing that reality is in some paradoxical way dependent upon consciousness and information. In biblical lingo, pneuma and logos, that is, words. And all along, Scripture has testified, matter really doesn't matter, only the word. Actually, in Hebrew, as I learned from one of my favorite authors, Richard Wormbrand, um, who's a Jewish Christian pastor, he writes that there really is no word for word in Hebrew, but only this word that is also translated thing or something real, that is reality. It's as if God is saying there's no such thing as a word that is not a thing, which is another way to say every lie is nothing but illusion. You know, in the beginning, God speaks all creation into existence as if all creation is his word. Debar in, in Hebrew, meaning word or thing or reality. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, uh, Greek is the language of the New Testament, Debar, it was translated right before the time of Paul and Jesus, but, but Debar was translated as Logos and Rhema. John writes, in the beginning was the Logos, or the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In Romans, Paul quotes Deuteronomy while writing in Greek, the rhema, debar in Hebrew, is near you, in your mouth, and on your tongue. In Greek thought, the Logos is like the underlying logic or reason. It's the information that holds all of reality together. And when you spoke a logon or a logos for a particular situation, you would often call, call it a, a rhema. Both logos and rhema are debar, which not only matters, but is in fact matter. <laughs> so the word, I'm just saying, creates and sustains everything that's anything. And the word saves, and the word in flesh is, is Jesus, and the word judges, redeems, and makes all things new. Behold, I make all things new, says the voice from the throne in Revelation 21, verse 5. But first, in Revelation 19, the word rides out on a white horse and cuts the flesh from all men. Because it then calls for the birds. Come and eat the flesh of all, all men. Not some men. All men. Adam. All Adam. All of us. The flesh is the me that I think I have created the body of sin and death, the illusion in which I'm trapped, the dream that I am my own creator, which has now turned into a nightmare. You know, a dream is an illusion. 
in which your own words and ideas have no substance. So in a dream, you think that you're doing everything, when in reality, you have actually done nothing. Romans 13, 11, the time has come for you to be raised to wake from sleep. Is the word that wakes us, makes us, and does everything that's anything. This is the word. Hanging on a tree in a garden. This is the judgment of God. This is the choice of God, the salvation of God, and free will of God. This is the righteousness of God. And now our text, this is the third time through, Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and pray to God for them, that's Israel, Paul's church, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to recognition. They don't recognize him. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end, the telos, the perfection, the completion, the fulfillment of the law for righteousness in everyone who believes, all the trusting, all the faithing. In his book, The Information, James Gleick, or Gleek, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, is it Gleek or Gleick? He's a, anyway, but in his book, The Information, he writes this. The alphabet was invented only once. All known alphabets descend from the same original ancestor. Semitic peoples, somewhere near Palestine, not much before 1500 BCE. He also notes how philosophers like Plato lamented this occurrence for something living, you know, like a spoken word attached to a living person, had become detached and lifeless when it became ink on a page. The written word. You offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, writes Plato, not true wisdom. Proverbs speaks of wisdom as a person, in fact, the person of the word through whom all things are created. But wisdom, who is the word of love, became law when written by God on stone for Moses somewhere near Palestine, not much before 1500 BCE or maybe just a little after 1500 BCE. And yet Adam, man, had already taken the life of wisdom on a tree in a garden somewhere near Palestine many years before. See, it's like God, who is love, and whose word is wisdom, said, okay, people, if you want the knowledge of good, here it is, written in stone. And now you know about the good, and you will learn that you have chosen evil. You know, it was the religious rulers of Israel who took the life of the word on a tree in a garden for they were offended by love and they lusted for law. And yet, in that same garden, Christ the word rose from the dead. And having learned that we had all chosen evil and so crucified the Christ, we learned in a new way that love chose us and fulfills the law in us, his body. So when and where is that garden? I was once alive apart from the law, wrote Paul in Romans 7, 9. And he had already written, in Adam, all die. So Paul lived before he died in Adam in the garden. In 2 Corinthians 12, he writes this about being, he writes that he was caught up into paradise, which is the same garden. That's where the tree of life is, according to the Revelation. See, Paul believed, he actually believed that he lived in that garden before all died in Adam, and that he had returned and still would return to that garden, which he also called heaven. Some people believe that Mount Zion is the location of the garden, for it's the ancient location of the temple. And it's 
pretty clear from the description that um, uh, the inner sanctuary of the temple clearly represents the garden. But as we've seen, we are now the temple, and it appears that the garden is in our hearts, and we can go there now, and perhaps only now. For now is the point where eternity touches time. It's the place where decisions are made. Or better yet, it's the place where the decision of God makes us. We wake to the decision of God, the word of God, the free will of God. Decision is the awakening to the eternal, wrote Soren Kierkegaard. So we are Adam, right? We've learned that. And we are Eve, the, the mother of the living, our Lord's church. Not a stone building or an institution, but a living body and a bride called to trust. And that means have faith, and that's the righteousness of God. Verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness of the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. And remember, they all died by them. But the righteousness of faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that's to bring Christ up from the dead. It's already been done. But what does it say? The words near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim, that we preach. Now, as we've learned over the past two sermons, Paul is quoting Moses at the end of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, and Paul is equating the righteousness of God, which is the free will of God, with the word of God, with the word of faith that we preach, and with Christ, who is Jesus. Now, that should blow your mind. But this will blow your mind. In fact, it has to blow your mind. Paul is saying that God was saying through Moses to the Israelites 1,500 years before Christmas and to you right now something like this. I've written my words on stone, but my words near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so you can do Christ. Christ is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, so you can do Christ, and yet it's Christ that's doing us, right? Well, how did Christ, this is a question, how did Christ the Word get into those Israelites before 1500 BCE and into you right now? Well, God created humanity in a garden, right? With His Word on the sixth day, when he breathed his spirit into some dust at the edge of time and eternity, perhaps it, it was then that Christ got in. But God also breathed his spirit into some dust when Jesus breathed on his disciples saying, receive the Holy Spirit on Easter. And when he surrendered his breath on the tree in the garden on Good Friday and it fell on the church at Pentecost, and when he gave us his body and blood, for the life is in the blood, that means the breath is in the blood, the pneuma, the spirit is in the blood, he gave them his blood at table on Thursday night, which for a Hebrew, now this is important, is the beginning of Friday morning, or the beginning of the day of, of Friday, the sixth day. So do you remember what happened that sixth day between the time he gave us his blood at the start of the sixth day. And we drew his blood as he surrendered his blood on the tree in the garden at the end of the sixth day, which Paul refers to as the end of the ages, the edge of eternity and time. I think it is the greatest mystery in the Bible. And in fact, we already sung it this morning. I think it's the one into which the angels long to look. After communion with us, the free will of God prayed an unthinkable prayer in a garden. A garden named the Olive Press. 
That's where olives get crushed and the oil comes out. That's what you use to anoint people and anoint us. Gethsemane. Matthew records Jesus as praying this. My father, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, and this is what we sang, not as I will, but as you will, if it be possible. Now, it's easy to conclude from that and what happened next, that it was impossible for God to save us in any other way than he did. And that's what we talked about last time, right? Why did he do that thing? But Mark records Jesus as praying this, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, all things are possible for you. And I think both of those things are true. If it be possible, and all things are possible for you. And then he prayed, remove this cup from me, yet, and this is what we're saying, not as I will, but as you will, what you will. That reveals that God didn't have to suffer the cross for us in Christ Jesus, but he wanted to. But in the very same moment, apparently, Jesus did not. For he prayed not as I will, but as you will. In other words, the free will of God, the judgment of God, the word of God, didn't want to do what he saw that his father was doing and willing at the start of the sixth day, and yet he is the will and the word of the father who does everything that's anything. This is Jesus who said that he only did what he saw his father doing, remember? He also said this, my food, the thing that energizes me, is to do the will of my father. This is Jesus who's one with the Father. Jesus, Jesus who said that no one takes his life from him, but, and he said this earlier, no one, takes it, no one takes his life from him, but he lays it down of his own accord. That's his free will. That's what we talked about last time. But in the garden, on the sixth day, he prays, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That means that Jesus wants to do what he doesn't want to do. His will's divided, right? He wants to do what he doesn't want to do because he knows that his father wants to do it even though he doesn't, which sounds exactly like you every time you pray. Which is, you know, like maybe a seed of faith or hope or love. So what's happening? Are you awake? Are you awake? Would you stay awake? Would you watch? Would you watch with me? Peter, James, John. We watch, asked Jesus. I think we're watching the faithful one create faith in Adam, which finishes all of us in the image and likeness of God. In other words, the free will of God is descending into the abyss that is the heart of Adam and our own deepest prison. That he might raise us to heaven with him. That is faith, hope, and love in you really is Jesus in you, willing what you do not will until all that you will is what God has always willed, and that's called heaven. God in Christ Jesus. This is the insane thing. He identifies with you. He who knew no sin became sin. He identifies with you in order that you would identify with him and then sit on his throne, literally ruling all things. In the words of Irenaeus in the second century, this is why the word became man and the son of God became the son of man so that man by entering into communion with the word and thus receiving divine sonship might become a son of God. Paul put it this way, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, uh, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him. This is gonna involve some travail. 
Anyway, you are predestined to become the undivided, fully free, and ecstatically happy body and bride of the resurrected Christ. Now, I can't comprehend that fully. I can just kind of watch that. I can't comprehend that, but I can watch it happen, and in this way, he comprehends me. I can't do that, but I can somehow watch that and come to know that I am being done in the image of the one who does everything. People always are asking this. From my 30 years as a pastor, what do I need to do? <laughs> what can I do? Apart from Jesus, I already said it, you can do no thing. But with Jesus, you can do all things. So before you can do anything, you must realize that you are something that is done. You must, in other words, become conscious of your own creation. You must watch Jesus as he prays. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You must watch and so commune with him in the garden. It's called faith. And it makes us hope. And it transforms everything into love, which binds all things together in this dance called life, eternal life. It happens in the garden, which is in the temple, which is you, and which is us, and it always happens now in that place where decisions are made or were made by the decision, that place where eternity touches time, it's how we become who it is that we actually are. For all the Romans who've been asking this question, remember, Janelle, you were the one that came up and said this because I wanted you to ask this question. How does the old Adam that I think I have created become the new Adam that I know is God's creation? How do I get from one to the other? Last time, we noted that it doesn't just happen at only one moment in time, but in every moment of time in which I abide with Jesus in the inner sanctuary rather than wander around out there in Mises. That's every moment I'm grateful rather than proud. That is every moment of faith. So you could think of every black dot as every decision made by my ego, which thinks it is its own creation, and every red dot as every decision made in communion with Jesus, that is every decision to love, because I know what? I know that I am beloved, I am loved. Every moment of faith. And faith will turn every black dot into a red dot over time. Every time I forgive someone, including myself, in the past, temporal sin is filled with eternal grace. Where sin abounded, grace will abound all the more. And I begin to walk in freedom into the reality of who I am. All the black dots will turn into red dots as I commune with Jesus over time. And as we've learned, that process feels like birth. Because it is birth. My new man is born of my old man, and my new man is Christ in me. The bride of Christ becomes the mother of Christ and gives birth to Christ in me and us, who it is that we actually are. So to the Galatians, Paul wrote this. I'm again in travail, birth pains with you until Christ be formed in you. It's a plural, and y'all, in y'all. So do you understand? Christ in you, which is the new you, grows over time as you walk in faith, hope, and love until all you are is faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love manifesting in a body of life risen from a tomb that you once thought was yourself. That's your old self. Or think of it this way. Because, see, I think the Bible's telling the same story over and over again in all these cool different ways. And maybe this is the same way. Everyone that's anyone, right, is a temple. For in the beginning, God breathed his uncreated breath into a bag of created dust by a tree in a garden, and in the breath was information, a, a word. Well, we've called that the I. Right, remember this, that observes me. 
in other words, becomes conscious of itself in time, the I that was once alive apart from the law. But when the law comes in and I take from the tree of knowledge in order to create myself in the image of God with my own judgments, I build an ego that I think is me, but is actually a, a prison or even a tomb. But the I is still there. Just like the presence of God behind the curtain in the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle that became the old stone temple. In that way, the I is like a seed, or better yet, an egg in the womb that is me. And if it wasn't there, I wouldn't be a person. I'd only be a bag of dust. I'm saying the word is in you. But when the word comes to you, as the word that is preached to you, Jesus, the promised seed, comes to you and is conceived in you, begotten in you. Deep calls to deep and you are begotten, sometimes translated born, begotten from above. The curtain in the temple rips and the new you that is Christ in you begins to fill the old stone temple like a growing baby fills a womb fills a womb until it's born from the womb, which looks like a death from inside of the womb, but is life and home and freedom on the other side. <laughs> now, don't know if I said all of that exactly right, but whatever the case, God through Moses says to Israel, 1,500 years before Christmas, the word is near you. In your mouth, in your heart, so you can do it. And Paul reveals that the word is Christ. So pop quiz. What happened to Christ when 1,500, 1,400, 1,300 years of that, that time, the Old Testament, what happened to Christ when Israel did not do the word and descended in Sheol, translated into Greek as Hades and sometimes into English as hell? What happened to the word? Remember he said, whatever you do, to the least of these, my brothers, well, that would be Israel, right? You do to me. He went with them, even as them. Romans 10, 8, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Verse nine, because if you confess with your mouth, that's where the word is, right? That Jesus is Lord, that's kurios in Greek. Now this is important too. That can be translated as master, mister, or sir, but it's used over 6,000 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament that Jesus and Paul read um, to translate the name Yahweh. But he isn't any old mister, master, or, or sir. He's the creator and the consuming fire. If you confess with your mouth, where the word is, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, where the word is, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses into salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For, and now he's going to quote the prophet Joel, everyone who calls on the name of, the article's not there, curiously. There's no article before Lord, as if Paul is thinking of a proper name. <laughs> the name of Lord will be saved. Now Paul is quoting the Hebrew prophet Joel, who wrote or spoke in Hebrew and, and wrote everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh. So when Paul says or writes kurios here, I think he also means Yahweh, which clearly implies that when Paul wrote Jesus is kurios, he meant Jesus is Yahweh and Yahweh is Jesus and that should rock your world. You know, we all freak out, don't we? I mean, I hear this all the time. To think that, that Yahweh would command the destruction of Jericho and everyone in it, Haram, the ban. 
But this means that Yahweh was also the God-man who said to Joshua, remember when he asked, are you on your side or their side? He said, no. <laughs> In the name of the Lord, I have come. Not on Israel's side or Joshua's, Jericho's side, but, but everyone's side. And check this out. It means that Yahweh was in Rahab the harlot. Within the walls of Jericho as an egg in her womb, Rahab the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, who is Yahweh. And Jesus was, and Jesus was in Yahweh as Yahweh called for the utter destruction of Jericho, the, the harem. And yet Yahweh also calls for the utter destruction, if you keep reading your Bible and you haven't put it down at that point, of Israel, according to Isaiah and all the prophets, and read your whole Old Testament and you find out that Yahweh also calls for the harem, the utter destruction of all humanity, which would include you. And we said, well, that doesn't sound like Jesus, but wasn't it Jesus who said, look, if you wanna be my disciple, you gotta pick up your cross. Do you know what crosses do? And come follow me. For whoever would seek to save his life, his psyche, will lose it. But if you lose it for my sake in the gospel, you'll find it. He's saving us from ourselves. If we errantly assume that destruction means endless conscious torment, well, then you see, Jesus is Yahweh is a pretty terrifying statement. But if we actually read and believe all the Old Testament and all the New Testament, knowing that nothing is impossible for God, we find that God destroys all, that he might redeem all, uh, that all might know he is salvation and he's with us all along. He never left us nor forsook us. Actually, we die with Yahweh in Christ Jesus and rise with Yahweh in Christ Jesus at a tree in a garden, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, writes Paul. Wait, wait, verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, of, of Lord, Yahweh, will be saved. We know that his name is Yahweh, I am that I am, uh, according to, to Joel. And we know that his name is also Yeshua, pronounced Jesus in English, meaning Yahweh is salvation or God is help, which is the very thing that Adam did not know in the garden, right? He was right there next to his helper and he was alone. And Yeshua, he taught us to call Yahweh Abba. <laughs> That's dad or, or daddy. Romans 8, 15, when we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father, it's the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of Lord will be saved. By the time of Christ, this is fascinating, the leaders of Israel had made it a law that no one but the high priest on the Day of Atonement could say the name of the Lord. For fear that those morons might take the name of the Lord in vain. So in seeking to establish their own righteousness, the leaders of Israel, Paul's church, forbid the people of Israel from being saved. For they forbid them from calling on the name of Yahweh, the Lord. And then, of course, they crucified Yeshua, Yahweh is salvation, the Word. They took his life seeking to turn living love into dead law that they could apply to themselves. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of Lord will be saved. In <clears throat> four chapters, Paul's going to quote Isaiah 45. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word, a swear word. He swore a word, and it will not turn back, writes Isaiah. To me, and this is God speaking through Isaiah, to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. When Paul quotes the same verses in Philippians, he writes this. God has given him, Jesus, a name that is above every name. What name is that? That every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, who we know is Lord. Paul clearly believes that everyone who ever had a tongue or knees will call in the name of the Lord and be saved. And how is that possible if Israel had already descended into Hades, hell? Well, Paul didn't mention anything about a time limit on the promise. 
1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul writes, no one can even say Jesus is Lord or Jesus is Yahweh except by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't even say that on earth or under the earth. But do you remember that when Jesus died and delivered up his spirit, and the curtain in the temple ripped from the top to the bottom, tombs were opened. And when he rose, according to Matthew, many bodies rose, and coming out of the tombs, they entered the city. All that bullshit about Jesus being unable to seek and to save the lost, that's what it is. And it cannot be found in the Bible anywhere. That Jesus is unable to seek and to save the lost after the body has died. And yet I know that the evil one whispers it to you. Sometimes even through the church. So that you would think to yourself, my life is hell. And it's too late to call upon the Lord. It's never, not ever, in chronological time, too late to call upon the Lord. And all of eternity is nothing but calling on the Lord. The door may be shut for a time, but listen closely, Christ the Word is also on your side of the door. In your mouth and in your heart. And this is Paul's entire point. Getting saved, sanctified, and redeemed is not up to you. It's the work of the Word. When you've been dead, and then he makes you alive, you will know Yahweh is salvation. And not, not just know it as like an idea or ink on a page. You'll know it as a life flowing in your veins, and you will rise and enter the city and begin to live for the very first time, which it turns out is all time, because it's eternity. First time, all time in freedom, perfect freedom. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Next verse. How then, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sinned? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Good news, that's gospel. Good news is not a bargain. It's not a threat. It's not an ultimatum. It's not any sort of transaction. It's not something that you can do. Good news is the statement of a fact that you do not control, and yet the statement of that fact utterly transforms your world. The war is over. That's good news. All your debts, they've been forgiven. Oh, that is good news. She loves you. He loves you. That's good news. The war is over, you've been forgiven, and God loves you. If is not good news. That's a threat. And someone just put the bomb right under your seat. And yet to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, even good news doesn't feel like good news if you don't believe. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed. Hupa kuo, this is a cool word, under here, under kuo, meaning they have not all listened to the gospel, the good news. Because Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he is a kuo heard from? That's the start of Isaiah 53. He is born our griefs and carried our sorrows later. Blah, blah, blah. Verse 17. So faith cometh from a kuo hearing and a kuo hearing by a word. So how do we hear by a word. This is a freaky weird thing to say because you hear words, words don't hear, right? Why? Why don't words hear? Well, because they're dead. They don't matter. 
at least not in our world where everyone assumes that everyone lies, and so everyone is alone. Words are dead. But what if a word came to life? What if that word is within us? Like a a spirit imprisoned in a jar of clay. You know, an old psyche, an old soul. And what if that word is outside of us? Like the creator of all things. And what if that word comes to us like good news from home? What if that word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, the clay prison and the breath? Just what if? Verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by a word of Christ. So is Christ dead or alive? Verse 18. But I ask, have they, has Israel, my church, not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the Psalm 19. Creation whispers the word all the time. Verse 19, but I asked, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. That's Deuteronomy 32. And lyrics to the song that Moses sings to Israel and that Israel was to sing when the law revealed that they had failed. Um, Next verse, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. That's Isaiah 65, one end of Isaiah, testifying that the word who was born of Greece and carried our conquerors has conquered the heart of the nations. The word is whispered by all creation, sung when the law has failed, and understood when rising from a tomb in a garden by a tree at the edge of eternity and time. Verse 21, but of Israel, the ecclesia, the church, He says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Meganoito. Hell no. By no means. For I myself am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And this is what we already read in Romans 8, 29. This is the point I think Paul is making. Those whom God foreknew, who does he not foreknow? We talked about that, right? That which he did not make. Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, made right. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So you're getting Paul's point. That's all the work of the word. And until we reach the end of time, the word is still working, for the word is the beginning and the end. This is the plot to the story that God is telling in time. And the word will accomplish that for which he was sent, writes Isaiah. He will accomplish that for which he is sent because I think it is accomplished. It has already been accomplished, written in place on a shelf in eternity, the Lamb's book of life. And now you may say, well, okay, this is kind of cool, Peter, but why does this matter? You're not giving me anything to do. (laughs) Why does this matter? So listen closely. It is the only thing that matters. It's the word. And when you have heard the word, hupakau, When you have really heard the word, you will speak the word. And far from doing nothing, you will do all things and give birth to the new creation, just like Mrs. Leonard gave birth to Mary Ann Bird. And Mary Ann Bird gave birth to faith, hope, and love in you, which is the true you. So why does this matter? Turn and look at someone. Doesn't matter who, anyone. Just look at them. Now keep looking at them. Just look at them. What do you see in them? Okay, now you can look back at me, so you're not distracted by what you see. 
What do you see in them, and what can you say to them? This is what really set me on this pilgrimage, asking God on evangelism projects, what, what can I say to them? If you believe what the church is so often taught, you can say, the war is over, you're forgiven, and God loves you, if you say this little prayer, and you mean it, and you'll know if you mean it because you'll give 10% to church, you'll join our institution, you'll make the pastor feel like a success, that's really important, or, or God doesn't love you and you're not forgiven and God will torture you forever and ever and ever without end because the war is endless. That will make you not want to talk to anyone. And that will make you nervous about everyone, particularly yourself. But what can you say if, and now the if belongs to Jesus. What can you say if you believe the word that Paul is preaching? You can say, the war is over and you're forgiven because God, our dad, loves you. He's always loved you. He will never stop loving you. Period. The end. You can say, I know who you are, even if you don't know who you are. You're a child of God, and he's nuts about you. So you run along and claim your inheritance. And you don't have to say it with words, you can preach it. You can preach it in a sermon, or you can sing it like a song. You can whisper it under your breath, even as the tone in your voice. Even better, you can proclaim it with your eyes, for you see Jesus in them, rising from the dead in them, and you know that he's good and that he conquers. And so you look past the evil, for you know it's a lie that will soon fade like a bad dream. And you celebrate every drop of faith, hope, and love just like you celebrate Easter, because it is Easter. It's Jesus rising from the dead right in front of you. And then, when you do that, when we do that, we're the church. Not an institution, not a program, not a building, but the bride of Christ, giving birth to the body of Christ. We're the mother of the living. I once read the testament of this girl who had been beaten by her pimp and was lying alone in an alley when she made a choice. She made a choice, or a choice was made in her to call her parents, and it saved her life. When asked what gave her the strength to do that and to make the call, this is what she said, and now I quote. I cheated and lied to my parents for two years before I ran away from home. Mom would try so hard to get through to me, but I treated her like dirt. Almost every day, my mother would tell me that she loved me. She would say to me, there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. Just words. I never gave her the satisfaction of knowing that her words were getting through. After running away, I would hear those words in every quiet moment. After being beaten senseless by the man who wanted to be my pimp, I was lying in a filthy alley, ashamed and beyond hope, and my drugged and beaten brain could only handle one thought. There's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. I picked up the phone, called my mom. I may have given up on myself, but there was hope that she had not given up on me. We're the church, and the devil has tempted us to give up on the world. But Jesus has called his bride to be mother to the world, for he has not given up on the world. For God so loved the world 
that he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the word of Christ. Believe. Believe.